Hello, and welcome to World Shared Practice Forum. My name is Dr. Sally Vitali, and I am an associate in critical care medicine at Boston Children's Hospital. Today, we're honored to have with us Dr. Heidi Dalton. Dr. Dalton is the medical director of adult and pediatric ECLS at Inova Fairfax Medical Campus in Fairfax, Virginia. She is a leader in pediatric critical care and extracorporeal life support, and has helped to develop numerous ECMO programs around the globe. Dr. Dalton, welcome. So Heidi, when you were last with us five years ago, you gave us an update on the state of ECMO in the world. And uh, at first, I think it will be great for you to update us uh, five years later on where things have gone, and then we'll talk about where things are going. Well, it's hard to believe that it's been five years since I've been here, and uh, thanks for my, very much for inviting me back. I think as a lot of us are aware, ECMO has been moving at light speed, uh, and so there really is a lot uh, to talk about in our relatively short time. Yeah. So I thought maybe what we should focus on is maybe four areas. And one of those would be like the expansion of ECMO that's occurring. Um, I think education, which we all recognize, is also occurring, but really there's a need for more and more. And then some of the enigmas that remain around ECMO that are uh, preventing it from um, expanding even further, you know, increasing morbidity and mortality, some of those type of issues. And then finally sort of talking about where we're going in the future and what you'll uh, be seeing in the next few years. So if we start first with uh, expansion, uh, this is data from the Extracorporeal Life Support Organization, which remains the largest repository of ECMO information in the world, about to uh, celebrate its 30th anniversary uh, in terms of creation this fall. Uh, we can see now that there are over, you know, 400 centers now that report data uh, to ELSO. And in the uh, ECMO database, there is probably over 100,000 patients now uh, on which uh, we have data recorded, both for pediatric, neonatal, and adult use of extracorporeal support. One of the things that's interesting is, at, is when you look at the changes that have occurred in terms of the world uh, in the use and expansion of ECMO. And uh, this is just looking at slides, uh, at centers per region, based on whether you live in Asia or Europe or North America or Southwest Asia or whatever. And you can see actually in every category, uh, there has been an increase in the use of ECMO in those countries. And actually, uh, North America, which remains uh, sort of still the largest contributor, at least of uh, data to ELSO, um, other groups are increasing in their uh, capacity to perform ECMO. And I think one of the things that we really want to focus on is how do we capture data from all the centers that are doing ECMO, because I think that will help uh, inform our field. And if we focus just on neonatal and pediatric ECMO, uh, it's interesting that if you look, even in North America, where the majority of data is reported, you know, the median number of patients that are being done per center is only about six. So uh, if you look in other areas of the world, you can see, again, the average number of patients that are done per center are actually relatively small in the neonatal and pediatric world. Now, certainly, if you also add in the adult population, adults are where the major expansion of ECMO is ongoing right now. But I think it is important to remember that if you're providing pediatric ECMO, um, unlike the old days before we had, you know, surfactant and nitric oxide and whatever you believe in that's uh, helped with respiratory failure, um, the numbers of patients that you're actually taking care of in many centers is quite small, mm -hmm. which causes uh, issues of its own. You can also see uh, that, as I just mentioned, the number of neonatal patients has dropped precipitously since the early 90s when ECMO was first, sort of first described. And as a result of that, uh, there are still about 500 neonates put on ECMO per year, but we're getting by with using other things and not having to resort to ECMO as a rescue therapy. In the uh, adult world, certainly adult pulmonary, adult cardiac uh, has really increased. And in the neonatal and pediatric world, certainly the use for cardiac ECMO is increasing every year. And then finally, we have this other category which came about a few years ago, ECMO during cardiac arrest, or eCPR, which is now becoming a hot issue uh, as well, and certainly uh, is a very resource-intensive um, procedure that you may perform in your hospital, and actually in some centers is now being performed uh, in the street, in the Louvre, and other okay. places. 
Um, if we look at neonatal respiratory failure for just a minute, again, this slide sort of just depicts how the decrease in annual runs of uh, neonatal respiratory ECMO has occurred. But again, you can see there's about 500, 800 patients that are still placed on neonatal ECMO uh, each year uh, across the world. And if you look at the diagnoses that go along with that, uh, as, an, as sort of an old dog now, um, it's interesting that respiratory distress syndrome, which used to be a big player, has almost disappeared. Uh, and certainly uh, what is driving the neonatal field still is uh, congenital diaphragmatic hernias, for which we really still don't have a great outcome, 50% outcome probably when I was here five years ago, the outcome was uh, the same. Uh, and then the other thing that's important is this other category, which is getting to be a larger proportion of uh, the registry and something that really needs to be more defined. We're certainly putting on patients that have more complex diseases, more comorbidities, and we need to hone down on exactly who that is to sort of draw good um, morbidity and mortality statistics from that. Certainly, if you're a neonate and you go on ECMO, the best reason is to have meconium aspiration. Those patients actually do very, very well. And even patients with pulmonary hypertension uh, also do quite well. Uh, sepsis, pneumonia, that sort of thing, not quite so great in terms of outcome, maybe because they have more multi-organ failure at the time of their ECMO institution. Uh, and if we look in the pediatric world, again, pediatric respiratory failure has gone up over time, but still it's only about five or 600 cases per year that are reported at least. And if you look at the um, diagnoses that go along with uh, pediatric respiratory failure, you can see, you know, it's pretty well split between viral pneumonia, bacterial pneumonia, that sort of thing. But again, the black bars are the patients with other reasons why they're going on ECMO, and we need to learn more about those patients, exactly what they are, uh, before we can really decide uh, what is the best mode of ECMO in uh, different diseases and what's the outcome associated. If you look at the common diseases that are reported, certainly, you know, viral pneumonia and bacterial pneumonia, uh, form uh, a fair amount of the patients that are put on ECMO, and their survival isn't terrible in the 70% range. Uh, but again, this other category, which now includes things like, uh, like asthma and sickle cell disease and, and maybe sepsis and that sort of thing, uh, certainly is an increasing uh, reason why patients are put on ECMO. And one of the problems with the ELSO registry is, for instance, sepsis. Some people will code sepsis as, oh, you're going on for respiratory failure because mm -hmm. respiratory failure is often associated. And other people will code it as cardiac because cardiac mm -hmm. failure is often associated. And that needs to be honed out a little bit better to give us actual important data that we need as well. And if you look in the cardiac side of things, again, neonatal cardiac ECMO uh, increases a little bit every year. The vast majority of those patients are patients with congenital heart defects, often postoperative or preoperative in terms of support. But as we know, you know, ECMO has also been used for cardiomyopathy, uh, cardiogenic shock. Uh, neonates don't have so much problems with um, myocarditis or whatever, but certainly there are those types of things that are reported uh, as well. And if we look on the pediatric side of things, again, there's a steady increase in the use of ECMO for pediatric cardiac uh, reasons. And again, a lot of those patients are on their second or third operation potentially for cardiac uh, repair of congenital heart defects. Uh, but there is an increasing amount of patients with like cardiomyopathy and myocarditis in the pediatric age group. Uh, but again, the other category, which is sort of a wastebasket of what is that, that? Yeah. Um, needs to be further defined uh, as we move forward. <clears throat> and then just to talk about eCPR for just a minute. ECPR is increasing in every age group that there is, uh, but certainly in the neonatal and pediatric world, most of those patients are in-hospital patients. Mm -hmm. uh, in the adult world, where ECPR is also increasing quite rapidly, uh, that actually is moving even out of the hospital. There are studies going on now, especially in Europe, where uh, people are being resuscitated on the street uh, with uh, very small cannulas and giving them some oxygen with a, a blood pump and seeing if that uh, helps reverse their uh, myocardial infarction or their V-fib arrest. In the R world, though, it's still mainly in the hospital and certainly mainly in the intensive care units uh, where we may be better set up to provide uh, eCPR support. If we talk about what else is new, again, adults are where the action is right now, uh, both with respiratory failure, cardiogenic shock, and cardiac failure. But we know even in the pediatric world, 
Uh, we are bridging people to heart transplant and lung transplant, both in the pre- and post-operative period. And it's interesting that if you look back 10 or 12 years ago, uh, in the pediatric world, at least, this was a contraindication to ECMO because we thought you'd never survive long enough to get an organ. And some of the other things that are new uh, sort of on the ECMO candidacy list would be supporting patients even with traumatic brain injury who may have an intracranial hemorrhage or have an intracranial uh, pressure monitor in place, uh, patients with trauma also being supported with ECMO, and then a personal interest of mine, patients with cancer, and even bone marrow transplant, bone marrow transplant being the group that has, still has the worst outcome. But certainly cancer patients uh, have been uh, supported with ECMO, and if you look in the literature, certainly uh, over the last 10 or 12 years, they now form about a third of the patients that are reported in the pediatric world, uh, and their outcome actually has improved to about 48%, I think. Sepsis is another category. I think those are the worst patients to take care of uh, in terms of um, being difficult to manage. If you have cold shock, I think you do a lot better than if you have warm shock. Okay. But some people with warm shock also uh, can survive. And then again, this other category that needs more uh, definition. And I think we know from the literature and probably from your own practice that the patients that we're putting on ECMO come in with mo more comorbidities and they're more complex patients. The healthy kid that comes in with pneumonia, you may pray for, but you rarely see anymore. They almost always have something else uh, that's going on. We'd like to turn to the audience now and ask a question. When responding, please leave your city and country location. The question is, approximately how many neonatal and pediatric cases do you support with ECMO each year? Do you have a program for eCPR? Also, does your center report data to ELSO? We're back now with Dr. Dalton. Now, one of the things that uh, we mentioned is that there has been an expansion of ECMO across the world. And this is just an excerpt from the ELSO website looking at where ECMO centers are placed throughout the world. And you can see now there is ECMO being practiced, you know, just about in every country uh, and in every continent uh, across the world. And this is great. Uh, these are centers that actually we know about and that report uh, data to the uh, ECMO organization. But we also know that there are a lot of centers out there who don't report data. Mm -hmm. And because of that, it makes it really hard to get a worldview of what's going on. Uh, it also makes it really hard to identify, okay, where are we having you know, problems? Where are the worst outcomes? Where are the best outcomes? How do we develop best practice and that sort of thing? And so uh, myself and a few other colleagues uh, got together and we created a survey monkey, which is a very short uh, survey. Uh, and it's aimed at just trying to get a handle on who is doing ECMO. And the, uh, the website uh, that you can go to, the link there, is on the slide. And I just encourage everybody, whether you do one case of ECMO, 100 cases of ECMO, you report data, you don't report data, it doesn't matter. All we're trying to do is get a handle on how many centers and how many patients are actually being treated throughout the world. So I would just sort of beg people to fill out this survey. We'll leave it open for uh, a few months. And uh, you can either be anonymous or you can give us your name and contact info and we'll send you the results, that sort of thing. But we really need to get a better handle on who is doing what uh, throughout the world so we know where to focus our efforts. Well, thank you, Heidi. I uh, continue to be impressed by how much uh, ECMO is expanding throughout the world, but the number of uh, cases per center also is pretty striking, the median number. And it mm -hmm. makes me wonder about uh, how challenging it is to have all the members of an ECMO team in all of these centers around the world be similarly educated uh, in how to uh, perform ECMO and how to have the best practices. So what are some strategies to try to make sure the whole world of ECMO is, is well educated? Uh, well, thanks. I think that uh, is a very important point. And certainly education is uh, you know, needed ubiquitously everywhere. Uh, the problem is that um, it's really hard to reach everybody everywhere. And certainly, you know, folks like myself, folks like you, you know, we, we can train and we can educate in our own center. I spend most of my time now running around the world um, trying to educate folks as well. Uh, and there are a lot of training courses that are out there that come with a combination of didactic teaching and simulation. You know, ELSO has their own courses. Every chapter of ELSO, Euro ELSO, SWAC, uh, Asia Pacific ELSO, everybody has their own courses that they run. 
Um, I just got back from teaching a course for the ATS, uh, CHEST, uh, the PED societies, the SCCM. Everybody runs uh, courses, and each center, actually, that I visit usually has their own internal method of educating their staff as well. Um, but the problem is, you know, how do you get everybody to go to these courses, you know, in this age of... Uh, reduction in reimbursement for travel for many uh, providers, nurses and such, uh, and the fact that you have to travel often to different places um, it makes it very difficult. And plus, if I train you or you train me, then how do I reinterpret that data in my own uh, center and how do we share the knowledge that we learn at some of these courses? But I think really, as I travel around, a lot of what people want is not just education. They want some type of certification or some means to say that they are competent. Mm -hmm. And I think that this is really a challenge uh, right now. Right now, every center sort of sets their own um, uh, criteria for when you are competent and how they credential you to do ECMO uh, in your own site. Certainly most of that uh, involves having some didactic teaching, some simulation type teaching, and then in many centers uh, you need to be precepted sitting the ECMO pump for several hours. And actually I think um, one of the uh, things to remember is that's very important as a physician as well. Yeah. So as I grew up, yeah, I was a resident uh, back in the day when ECMO was really getting started, actually to date myself a little bit. <laughs> and I made moonlighting money by sitting the pump as an ECMO tech. And I think you do learn a lot of nuances of what's happening by spending a few hours, even if you're the physician in charge, of pretending that you're the ECMO tech and seeing actually how things work and what your techs are actually doing and that sort of thing. There are some training courses that offer CME and some tests as well that are out there. Uh, those are not meaning that you're competent. It only means that you have passed these modules, blah, blah, blah. And in some centers, uh, that is considered sort of a, a prerequisite for doing ECMO uh, in your particular site. But there really isn't a national or international certification for extracorporeal support like there is, for instance, for neonatology or pediatric critical care or cardiology. Now I will say on the board exams, at least in pediatric critical care, which is what I'm most familiar with, there are questions now related to ECMO, but it's not like there's a whole ECMO certification. I mean, I think it's mainly like, do you know which way the blood flows right. or something? Uh, and so right now we're at a point where any center in the world can start ECMO. I mean, you can buy a pump and therefore you can do ECMO. In some countries, this is controlled by governmental practice or whatever, and you're not allowed to start ECMO without applying for um, a certificate of need or something like that. Mm -hmm. But really, I think that's the minority of places. And while that's great, I think one of the things that um, is problematic about that is there really isn't any way to differentiate who's doing ECMO well versus who is doing ECMO poorly and could potentially use some more education. Now, one of the things that the ELSO organization has done is develop this center of excellence, which comes in various forms. You can be a gold level, a silver level, or I think the highest one is a platinum level. And uh, this isn't really a rubber stamp type thing. You actually have an application that is fairly rigorous. You have to meet all these different requirements in terms of training and education and outcomes and protocols and all that other type of things. And at least in the States, if you are a center of excellence, uh, you sort of get bonus points in US, U.S. News and World Reports, which is very important to your administrators. Uh, and if uh, JACO, the uh, health organization that uh, credentials hospitals in the U.S. anyway, if you are an ELSO Center of Excellence, they seem to like that when they come to review your hospital as well. But there isn't any specific uh, certification for ECMO practice as there is for things like um, ventricular assist devices. If you do ventricular assist devices and you want to be paid for it, you have to report your data. You have to be recognized as a center that is allowed to do that uh, by uh, other groups, including uh, third-party payers. But is this enough? Well, it's probably not enough. Um, and centers that, that uh, support only a few patients, you know, one of the questions I get asked all the time is, how do we maintain competency uh, if we're only providing care for a few patients? And so uh, one answer, I'm not sure this is the answer, mm -hmm. but certainly one answer, one thing to think about is this whole field of telemedicine mm -hmm. or web-based access. Uh, to ECMO support. And certainly if you look at other parts of intensive care, let's say, 
Um, telemedicine has been helpful in reducing mortality in ICUs where there's potentially minimal coverage with physicians or whatever, or it's a very small ICU and they mm -hmm. see something that's relatively uncommon. And so uh, one of the things that I have talked about with some of my colleagues uh, for the past couple of years and never really gotten off the mark is this idea that we could have like an expert group that would function as consultants mm -hmm. And you could, you know, call them up and they could help you manage patients. Or if you're a center that's just starting, maybe we would help you manage the first few patients to sort of uh, see that you're able to apply the knowledge that you have gained by doing simulation exercises and uh, didactic training, maybe through modules uh, or courses that you attend, and how you apply that actually to the patient uh, population. And certainly this is done with other fields. You know, there are centers that uh, support liver transplant programs in other countries yeah. or cardiac programs in other countries. And I think actually this is a place where um, teleecmo actually may have a role. So one of the other groups, obviously, Open Pediatrics, has been very effective in bringing education to the world. Um, you know, there is the, the dialysis simulators that are out there, the mechanical ventilation simulators that are out there. And certainly, I think uh, a group like Open Pediatrics can really help inform the ECMO field uh, as well by potentially looking at more specific ways to educate about ECMO and related technologies that are coming down the pike uh, as well. And I hope that we'll see more of that coming down the pike in the future as well. We'd like to turn to the audience now and ask a question. When responding, please leave your city and country location. The question is, do you have a single provider, in other words, one nurse, or a dual provider, a nurse and an ECMO specialist model, for providing ECMO care at your hospital? Who is responsible for educating ECMO providers at your institution? Now back to our conversation with Dr. Dalton in addition to the telemedicine and how it may help with uh, situations when you're on ECMO, uh, it's also hard to evaluate some of these um, indications and contraindications for ECMO that, that, frankly, we never would have put on 10 years ago that now we evaluate uh, in our institution on a, uh, maybe not daily, but weekly basis. So how do you advise um, all the centers around the world uh, in terms of how to think about some of these patients that aren't sort of don't have the classic indications uh, for ECMO. Um, it's also important to remember, since the field of ECMO is expanding so rapidly, that even if you are in a center where there's 30 years of experience or whatever, the way we do it today is not the same as how we did it before. And so, for instance, uh, there has been a big movement in the last few years from roller pumps to centrifugal pumps in many centers. Big learning curve. How do you educate people like that? Uh, and for instance, if you're in a center that's only done neonatal ECMO, and now you're branching out to pediatric ECMO and eCPR, or you're branching out to adult ECMO, um, how do you sort of uh, use the expertise that you have in one area and bring it to another area? And certainly for centers that are starting or have adult ECMO, I think one of the biggest failings, and this is on both sides of the table, the adult side and the pediatric side, is that you can have a totally separate pediatric and neonatal program that has nothing to do with the adult program. Yet, the pediatric and neonatal people may have done ECMO for 10 or 20 years. And I think the fact that there isn't a lot of crosstalk in those centers actually uh, delays knowledge information back and forth. And actually, uh, I would encourage centers that are doing both adult ECMO and pediatric ECMO. I think neonatal actually is a little bit different. Uh, but uh, to talk together, because I think there is a lot of cross-learning and cross-education that can occur. Truthfully, every case that we do these days is pretty much case by case. You get folks together and discuss, I don't know, do we think it's the risk benefit ratio is in one way or another. Mm -hmm. And certainly, I think, depending on your level of um, experience, it plays into it too. You know, the first patient that you want to put on is not a bone marrow transplant patient with septic shock and respiratory failure. You know, you want to get some wins under your belt before you branch out to patients that have, you know, a much lower potentially uh, chance of survival. Now, having said that, what usually happens, there's somebody that comes along that you don't expect, and then it's like, oh my gosh, now what we do? What do we do? But uh, there have been uh, changes in criteria, as I mentioned uh, before, and certainly as we have tried to learn more about who we should put on, there have been several scores that have been developed. There's the Peach Rescuer score, the PrEP score, the PEP score, all of those things. 
And I think all those scores have some value, but none of them are ready for prime time. And so one of the things I would caution folks for is this is the PEDS Rescuer score, which is developed from the ELSO database review. Um, and you can see that actually, you know, it was kind of helpful in that uh, they were able to see that Truthfully, free ECMO vent settings, blood gases, and all that things between the two eras where this was developed were not a whole lot different. Um, uh, they did were able to see that if you had uh, a high mean airway pressure, a longer duration of intubation, and that's and the use of milrinone, which I find kind of interesting, yeah. other than maybe it just means you have cardiac failure yeah. or associated with bad outcome. But some of the problems with this is, if you look at the uh, data from which this was derived, 48% of the patient population was excluded for missing data. Mm -hmm. And so I think you have to interpret these scores uh, extremely carefully in terms of what they mean, and they are certainly not meant to be used on an individual basis. They may be able to be used on a center-wide basis, or when you're counseling families, it's like, well, from the uh, data that we have available, we would expect that maybe you have a 50% chance of survival or a 20% chance of survival or whatever. This is the PEDS PREP score, which is also uh, uh, validated from the ELSO registry and then also compared to data from the uh, FIS registry, which is an administrative database that's available here in the U.S. Uh, and again, I'll just point out that a lot of the variables that you would think would be important, especially if you're uh, trying to develop a respiratory failure score, uh, PEEP was missing, mean airway pressure was missing, and that sort of thing. So you have to look at these things. I have they, they, they have some utility, but you have to use them uh, very, very carefully. Uh, this score uh, has a range that you can have uh, between a negative number and a positive number. Uh, and if you have, uh, in this particular evaluation, if you had a score of uh, minus 10 or more, uh, those, all those patients survived. Uh, if you had a positive score, more than 40, all those patients died, although there were very few of them. And certainly the more extrapulmonary uh, organ failures that you had increased your mortality, which I don't think is news to anybody. Uh, and probably the newest, and this is just sort of the um, expected and observed mortality uh, that went along with that score. And you'll notice that, you know, the, the AUC there is about uh, 0.69, which is, you know, better than a coin flip, but it's not that great, you know, and certainly not ready to be used on an individual basis. The PEP score, uh, which ju has just been uh, published in PEDS Critical Care, uh, it was a subset uh, analysis of an NICHD project uh, looking at bleeding and thrombosis in ECMO patients. Uh, and certainly the idea behind this was that uh, we recognized, that this is a project that actually I was involved in, that we recognized the limitations of some of these other scores. And since this was an you know, NIH project, the data that was collected was much more complete. Uh, and we were able to use that data uh, to sort of develop the score and see if it did a little bit better. Uh, and certainly in this particular uh, PEP model, uh, the uh, area under the curve or whatever was about 0.75, so a little bit better maybe than some of the other scores, but certainly uh, not ready for prime time either. And what we're doing with that particular score now is we're externally validating it against a couple of other large databases, also potentially being one and some other large databases that exist as well, to see if maybe it's helpful. But um, in, in just the, the short story, I would say none of these scoring systems are ready for prime time, but I think they do point out the fact, again, that we need everybody that's doing ECMO to report data. Mm -hmm. Because the only way to refine these scores uh, and get accurate results is to have more data from everybody that's doing ECMO. And certainly, I think this is one of the obstacles that we have right now. The other thing is the ELSO database uh, is often not for having incomplete data, the fact that it's a voluntary database, mm -hmm. how do you know the data is accurate, how do you know that people are only putting in their good data and not their bad mm -hmm. data. And so uh, the ELSA organization uh, has done a couple of audits actually uh, of the data, which has showed that actually the data is not that bad. Uh, but right now they're in the process of doing a more formal auditing process with an outside company to sort of look at the data and say, okay, is what we're seeing realistic? Where does it need to be changed? And I think that that may help um, uh, answer some of the questions that some people may have about the validity of the uh, ELSO uh, registry. Now certainly one of the other enigmas 
uh, for which I also don't have a good answer, is how to solve uh, bleeding and thrombosis. Mm -hmm. And certainly those remain the most difficult problems with ECMO. And truthfully, if they were not there, I do think that ECMO might be applicable to just about everybody, yeah. you know. Um, but uh, despite the fact that we all have now a lab test for every single factor known to man, uh, we have a lot of new equipment, uh, we have better understanding of pathophysiology, certainly factors that I didn't even learn about in medical school and are now there. There really hasn't been a change in terms of outcome uh, with bleeding and thrombosis uh, over time. And you look at the occurrence of bleeding and thrombosis. This is, again, data from the NIH project, 514 kids uh, in eight large uh, children's centers in the U.S. You can see that 70% of the patients had bleeding events defined as a need for blood transfusion, and over a third of the patients had thrombotic events uh, as well. And interestingly, uh, as we defined bleeding as a need for transfusion, 42% uh, of the transfusions that children and neonates received was in some fashion related to replenishment for lab sampling, mm -hmm. which certainly is a clinician-driven uh, factor and something I think mm -hmm. we probably don't talk enough about. You know, you can draw blood off the ECMO circuit very readily, but really, do you need values every hour or every two hours in terms of when you're caring for these patients? If we look at how bleeding and thrombosis occur, again, this is data from the uh, BAIT data set, uh, which actually showed that your risk of bleeding, your risk of thrombosis, and your mortality was actually relatively consistent across time, although most of those events occurred in the first 10 days of ECMO. But that was predominantly because, you know, 95% of the patients were off ECMO by 10, uh, by 10 days. And the reason I think that's important is as we're moving into longer and longer durations of ECMO, it is important to remember that your risk of bleeding and your risk of thrombosis actually remain fairly constant. So it isn't just the first day that you have to worry about it. You do have to worry about these things on an ongoing basis uh, as well. When we looked at uh, the reasons for a transfusions uh, or bleeding and thrombosis in this patient population, this is just sort of the multivariate analysis as shown here. And certainly one of the things I think will be of no surprise, you know, if you were older, you did a little bit worse. Uh, if you were placed on, by, on ECMO directly from cardiopulmonary bypass, you did a little bit worse. Uh, certainly, uh, if you had cardiac reasons for ECMO or eCPR reasons, you did a little bit worse than the respiratory patients. Uh, and certainly organ failure, the number of organ failures you had influenced your outcome. But certainly, I think one of the things uh, that is important to talk about and probably not talked about enough is the fact that center variability also had an impact mm -hmm. in both uh, thrombotic events and bleeding events in this very large data set. And certainly, I think, again, that is a reason why, if we all work together, and I have a center in which my bleeding rate is half of yours, mm -hmm. why is that? Mm -hmm. you know? And if we're going to talk about developing best practice, I think the transparency in reporting data to identify centers who do things maybe a different way, maybe it's based on their population or something, mm -hmm. uh, is one way to inform the field and potentially improve uh, outcomes. And again, when we looked at um, death in terms of overall uh, multivariate analysis, again, clinical center turned out to also be important in terms of outcomes. And I, again, I will just sort of you know, harp on the fact that if we're going to develop best practice, um, I think this is very important. Now, the other thing that I have been preaching the last few years is that I think in order to answer some of these questions, anticoagulation and that sort of thing, we are going to have to standardize some level of care. Mm -hmm. Because if you introduce one variable, let's say um, I decide to use heparin, you decide to use a direct thrombin inhibitor, or you're a big anti-thrombin replacement pay, uh, center and I'm not. If we don't control for some things, like are we using the same pump? Are we using the same oxygenator? Are we using the same coding? Can we agree to use the same anticoagulation regimen for the good of the science during this particular mm -hmm. evaluation? Can we come up with transfusion triggers for blood and platelets and that sort of thing that we all agree on? Even if we can only do that in a subset of centers and then say, okay, well now let's look at, 
bival versus heparin, which is a hot item right now, or antithrombin replacement, then I think we can actually learn something. Many years ago, I put in a planning grant to the NIH to look at antithrombin use. And the idea was to do a planning grant to do a really good study on antithrombin replacement. And the one thing that came back from the reviewers every single time was, well, if you can't control all these other variables, introducing antithrombin, how are you going to know? Yeah. And so I got centers to agree that we would agree to standardize this X, Y, and Z and handed it back in. And the NIH came back and said, this is a great idea, but we believe it's impossible to be done. And I think we now know, based on some other work, uh, that you can standardize care across mm -hmm. some fashion. The other thing to talk about is maybe even if you can't standardize care, can you do uh, comparative effectiveness trials where you do collect all the data and then you look to see, oh, you know, this yeah. center does this and their outcomes are better. And potentially uh, that will require less standardization. You're certainly not going to get a randomized controlled trial, right. I think, for a lot of these different things. But I think that may be another way uh, to help inform the field of what is uh, best practice. So, you know, uh, just to sort of wrap this up for just a second. So I think we all know that there are a myriad of tests that people are using to monitor anticoagulation. And I think one of the things that's important is, A, there is no regimen yet that says one method is better than yeah. another. That's important to remember. There also is uh, not a consensus on what drug is better. Most people are using heparin. A lot of people are changing to bivalirudin or other direct thrombin inhibitors. Many of us are using PTT, many of us are using ACTs, many of us are using TEGS, thromboelastic rafts now much more uh, than we used to, be, uh, you or used to use or viscoelastic testing. Uh, and I think all of those things potentially have a place in terms of guiding us. But again, I'll just remind people, if anybody has developed a silver bullet in terms of how to monitor anticoagulation and what is the best thing to do, I certainly haven't seen it and you know, you'll probably win the uh, Nobel Prize or something <laughs> if you come up with that. We'd like to turn to the audience now and ask a question. When responding, please leave your city and country location. The question is, at your institution, what laboratory values do you use to monitor anticoagulation on ECMO? Do you use PTT, anti-10A levels, or ACT, or some combination of those to monitor how well you're anticoagulating a patient on ECMO? So, Heidi, um, thank you for delving into the anticoagulation. I know it's always the most difficult discussion because I agree that we it's not standardized and there's really um, not one single best practice. Uh, another problem that we run into a lot is uh, what to do with the mechanical ventilator when we're um, supporting someone with ECMO who has respiratory failure. Not only what to do about it during the run when we don't expect any lung function, but what do we do when we're starting to uh, think that the patient may be approaching the time to uh, decannulate and how to handle the ventilator then? So uh, certainly one of the uh, other enigmas that I don't actually have a good answer to, and I don't think anybody else does either, is what to do with the ventilator, mm -hmm. both during ac ACMO and uh, before and then the after phases. And certainly one of the concepts that's hot out there right now is this whole concept of mechanical power. Uh, this is Gatnoni's uh, more recent uh, belief system about how we should look at how we're damaging the lung. And the problem with that is we're not really sure when it starts. We're not really sure which part of the power calculation is most important. And then it makes it a little bit difficult to figure out what level of ventilation is safest or harmful uh, to our patients. So certainly one of the things that has been uh, published, at least in the adult world, is that when they looked at PEEP as a mode of uh, keeping your lung expanded for the first few days of ECMO, this is an international survey published a few years ago now, they found that patients with a higher PEEP over the first few days of ECMO had better outcomes. And if we apply that to our pediatric population, I think it's interesting to look back to Marty Kessler's old data from the 80s, actually. And this is a neonatal study in which he also looked at patients who he gave a higher PEEP level to. I think it was like 4, 10 to 14 versus 5. And certainly those neonates with higher PEEP got off ECMO faster uh, and actually uh, had a shorter uh, duration of ECMO without an increase in mortality. And it's, a, it's kind of funny to think about that this was a study back from the 80s, actually, uh, which I'm not sure uh, we go back and actually look at some of the data that's already out there.
Now, uh, if you apply uh, the mechanical ventilation data that has been uh, talked about from the Amato group, for instance, driving pressure being very important as a predictor of outcome in adults with respiratory failure, this study, also an adult study, uh, also found that driving pressure was important in patients that were on ECMO, was highly associated with in-hospital mortality. Uh, and if you maintained a driving pressure, that is the difference between your plateau pressure or PIP almost that we use as a replacement in pediatrics and your PEEP between 10 and 15, that those patients did better. And when they looked at different things like PEEP and PIP and plateau pressure and respiratory rate, et cetera, those things really didn't fall out as predictors of outcome. One thing that seems to be um, always in the equation for severity of illness and poor outcome is if you're unable to clear lactate when you're on ECMO, if you remain very badly acidotic over the first 24 hours or so. Those are always uh, harbingers of uh, bad outcome. The other thing that has come about, which is very recent, is this whole concept of is hyperoxia bad for you? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, there are several studies out there now, several in pediatric and in the adult realm as well, in which patients that are exposed to a higher degree of FiO2 and have a higher PO2 have worse outcomes. And that was certainly true in this particular study uh, as well. And certainly, if you want to lump this all together and uh, put all the data that has been developed predominantly in the adult world uh, in terms of what kind of vent settings have been associated with good and bad outcome during uh, ECMO support. This editorial by Eddie Fan, which gives a, uh, in tabular form um, a uh, complete list of how driving pressure and respiratory rate and PEEP and all those things have uh, been equated with uh, outcome, I think is a good thing to look at. Now, having said all that, there is another article which just published last week, uh, another survey of mechanical ventilation in the adult world in ECMO, uh, done in a large number of centers with pretty complete data. And also what they found was, lo and behold, none of the ventilator parameters that I just talked about seemed to make any difference. Uh, and truthfully, it was ma mainly based on how much organ failure you had and what your uh, lactate and that sort of thing was. It also seemed to indicate that most centers now have adopted this idea of ultra-protective ventilation during ECMO. So going back to the ARDS net data of low tidal volume, if you look at data, most of us now are limiting our tidal volumes. Uh, we are maintaining some expansion with PEEP. Now the flip side of that is there's also this huge movement now to keep people awake, right, mm -hmm. and mob mobile, and to have them spontaneously breathe. And I am a big believer that this is helpful. Mm -hmm. um, it is not always the easiest thing to do. And if you look at some of Gatnoni's work, for instance, uh, in his center, they look, tried to look at spontaneous breathing, and they found that in patients who had very bad ARDS and very consolidated lungs, less than a third of those patients could really be maintained in a spontaneous breathing mode without generating either such high intrathoracic pressures they affected the ECMO flow, mm -hmm. or they were breathing with such high respiratory rates that they were in danger of causing you know, barrel trauma mm -hmm. in and of themselves. And I think that's true in pediatrics uh, as well. So I encourage people, to wake patients up and let them breathe spontaneously. I have had patients, you know, extubated on ECMO and that sort of thing. But on the flip side, I also recognize it ain't as easy to do as what we pretend it is. And if certainly if you're a patient that we're bridging to lung transplant or something, it's a lot easier than the patient who has full-blown ARDS. Uh, ARDS who you actually need to keep out for the first several days uh, of their care. And so sort of summing up the whole um, conversation about mechanical ventilation, not really sure what we're supposed to be doing. Um, the whole idea, though, for respiratory failure patients is to protect the lung, right? right. That's why you're on ECMO in the yeah. first place. I do believe that if you need mechanical ventilation during ECMO, I do maintain PEEP, you know, and I usually use a PEEP between like 10 and 14. Uh, on the other hand, if you're able to be weaned to spontaneous breathing or even extubated, great. Maybe that's uh, fine for you. Um, I don't believe in recruitment maneuvers. I don't believe in hi-fi during ECMO. I don't believe in percussive ventilation, all these sort of things that you may also see in the literature. Uh, because I think what we have learned, especially from our Swede colleagues who I think still do probably the best job with ECMO in the world, when the lung is ready to open, it's going to open. And the hardest thing for all of us is to be uh, patient. And certainly with very bad ARDS, um, I do believe some of the adult world data now, which you may even need 
you know, neuromuscular blockade during the first few days of ECMO. Uh, if you're really hypoxemic, does prone positioning help even on ECMO? Yes, it may help you. Uh, but I do think, you know, patience is the hardest part. If, again, you go to the Swedes, and thanks to Polly Palmer from the Karolinska for sharing these slides, this is an example of why we need to be patient. So this is just one patient, a young guy that had um, staph pneumonia. And you know, for over 45 days of ECMO, he had zero tidal volume, like zero tidal volume. Was awake, alert, interactive, and actually had uh, oxygen saturations during this period of only 65%, uh, percent, but yet he was awake and conversive. And so I think this is a lot uh, different than what we would have thought in the past. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, this is him when he was discharged, coming back, he's working out, he's normal now and all this stuff, but he's a pretty healthy looking uh, guy. And if you look at even our pediatric population, this is a young girl that had staph pneumonia, also a slice from the Karolinska. And you might look at this and say, oh my God, these lungs are trash. I you know, hope she makes it to a transplant. But one of the things that we've learned now is if you go out over time, this is like five years later, and you can see she has grown new lung. And so this remodeling of lung tissue, which we didn't think used to happen except in young kids, and that's the reason why you know, we support kids with BPD, or, for instance, uh, we believe now, and even in the adult world, that this is possible and is certainly leading to a lot of the changes that we're seeing uh, in ECMO. And certainly as we move in sort of into the exploratory phase, this is the reason now why some of these new devices are being developed because CO2 removal in these patients during the remodeling phase can be very bad. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of these devices now, which require very low flow ECMO, but take out a lot of CO2, are coming on the market. The um, the uh, Xenos device, which is a very small pump head, a 13cc pump head, you know, is also on the market and can do full-blown ECMO or just CO2 removal as well. And certainly wearable devices now is where we're going to in the future. You know, the artificial lung is really not such prime time craziness anymore. Uh, and that's true in the pediatric population and in the adult population. And I actually think these things are fairly close to prime time. The other thing that's important to remember is as we're going longer and longer with duration of ECMO, what are we going to do with all these patients? Can they stay in the hospital? Mm -hmm. Can they fill up your ICUs? And we're going to have to figure out, I think, where to m move them. If these systems are easier to use and can be servo-regulated and you can get up and walk around with them, do you even have to be in the hospital? And certainly, again, this is... Uh, uh, data from the Karolinska Institute where they took this patient home. She wanted to have tea at home. Uh, and so they took her home so that she could actually have tea with her family at home. And sometimes these are going to be good events, you know, just give them a day out. And some of these potentially, if you think about it, maybe ways to even do palliative care. Yeah. You know, I want to die at home. Okay, can we orchestrate that for you? Can we take you home and then withdraw support? Something we would think is crazy a few mm -hmm. years back. And these modular forms of ECMO, I think, are going to be something that is going to revolutionize the field as well, as long as we're able to get the anticoagulation thing uh, under control. And finally, servo control. You know, right now we have AICDs. We have insulin pumps. Is it possible in the future that all of this will be servo regulated? Oh, look at this. Your saturations are higher. Let's wean the pump. You know, your CO2 is lower. Let's drop the sweep gas. Can this be servo regulated? And how well these things work, I think, uh, you know, really kind of remains to be seen. But it is interesting how our technology is moving sort of at the speed of light to try and make extracorporeal life support more applicable to a wider variety of patients. Well, Heidi, th thank you for that, uh, all that information about the future of ECMO. Um, it's going to be really exciting to see uh, which of these things comes down the line and which of them comes first and how soon we can get our young patients these uh, uh, wearables and exciting stuff in the future. Um, and I think also it's been really helpful to, for us to think about uh, how, how much the ECMO world is expanding, the uses of ECMO are expanding, and how we're going to uh, keep everybody in line in terms of uh, spreading ECMO education around the world um, and coming together on how exactly we're all practicing in all the corners of the globe uh, so that we can ultimately improve outcome for our ECMO patients. So thanks for being here with us today, uh, and I look forward to having you back. Hopefully it uh, won't be five more years, but uh, to see where things go in the future. Thanks very much. I've really enjoyed my time and uh, hope this has been helpful. Yeah.